Please open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, and if you stand, I'll be reading verses 41 through 46. Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46. And we're finishing out Matthew 22, and we are... Jesus will leave us with a final question, and it will be ringing in our ears as we consider the truth of what he says this morning. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. Please be seated. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. This is a quote from Gandhi. And although that may be certainly true as Christians wrestle to love like Jesus did and live like Jesus did, there's a really serious problem with Gandhi's quote. That is, Gandhi didn't know Christ. And he certainly didn't believe that Christ was God. He thought of him as just a man, maybe a good man, maybe a great teacher. But much like the world around us today, he viewed him from a human lens. Had Gandhi looked a little deeper into what what Christ said, he certainly wouldn't have liked him so much. And he might have had a greater appreciation for those who are truly trying to follow Christ. Of course, there's no better time than at this Christmas time where the basis of the celebration is Christ, that we would remember that the world has no clue as to who Christ actually is. They don't know who the Messiah is. So the question that Jesus asks here is very appropriate for our day and age, but also very appropriate for our our time, our time of year. This is what we ought to be asking. Who is the Christ? The world has all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of ways that they express who Jesus is. Some just dismiss him. Most would say a historical figure of some sort who was a good man, but that is certainly not who Jesus is. This Christmas, the world, as perhaps never before in our lifetime, is in need of a Savior. But no man can fill that role. We're certainly far beyond, have always been far beyond being saved by the institutions of men. We need a real Savior. We need an all-powerful, all-wise, all-loving, all-just God who can deal with our slavery to sin and our sure judgment in hell. And thankfully, we have one. So what we'll see this morning is that Jesus is the King the Messiah, who is the true Son of David and the mighty Lord God. Thus, he is fully qualified to save his people and receive their worship. Jesus is the King, the Messiah, who is the true Son of David and the mighty Lord God, and thus he is fully qualified to save his people and receive their worship. Jesus is the Son of David and the Lord of all. In Matthew 22, as we come to the end of the chapter, remember, we're not coming to the end, really, even of this day of ministry. Jesus is in the middle of a very long day. He entered into the temple. He's been teaching there. And this began with a question of his authority. They said, by what authority are you doing these things, cleansing the temple, really even entering Jerusalem to the cries of, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How is it that you are, are cleansing the temple and claiming the praise and worship even of those in the temple. By what authority do you do this? And Jesus really has been indirectly answering that question. And he leaves them with a final thought here. He will silence them, as our text says. He he will then launch and he, he will remain in this day of ministry. He's going to launch into a scathing rebuke of them. But in his final question, as he silences them, he's really going to, in a final way, answer their question of authority. He's going to do it indirectly. But nonetheless, he's going to leave things where they must be. The Messiah is God. That's the authority that the Messiah has. Even more than the son of David, even more than a ruler in the line of David, as we will see, the Messiah is God. That's my authority. Bend before me. Bend the knee. That's Jesus' point, and we'll work our way through that this morning. Remember that Jesus just finished up answering their question. So they asked a final question. What's the greatest commandment of the law? Essentially, What's the one thing that needs to be done for us to be saved? What do you think, Jesus? And Jesus answered that question. We spent multiple weeks on it with very familiar words to us. And yet, remember, the content is not well understood. He says in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God. This is the great and foremost commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The second is like it. 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He said, love. And last week we discussed the fact that Jesus finishes that out, making it as weighty as could possibly be. He says the whole Bible rests on those two commands, really the one command with a corollary. The second is like it. If you love God, you will love your neighbor. And we looked at that in detail. What does it mean? The whole Bible, Old and New Testament, rests upon this one thought, this idea that we must love God, and that out of that love flows a love for others. Well, if it's misunderstood, it's whatever you want love to be. It's the warm fuzzies of the Christmas season. It's family and friends and the fireplace. Well, love is so much more. Or it's Disney and and whatever you think love ought to be, whatever you dredge up in your heart. Well, what a devastating thought that all of the Bible would depend on what you think or what you can dredge up from your own heart or what some songwriter can come up with. The whole Bible is based on a true understanding of love. And as we said last week, all of the Bible is necessary to understand what love actually is. That's why Jesus can say, on these two commands depend the whole law and the prophets. What did he mean? Well, we saw that it meant that the love is our primary obligation towards others. And we turn to Romans 13 and it said, Oh, nothing to anyone except to love. The fulfillment of the law really is to live out our obligation towards others. And what is that? To love them. And if we do that, then we will fulfill the commands and principles of the law that we are to obey in this dispensation, in our time. We said that love provides the motivation and power to obey the principles of the law. The Pharisees obeyed out of, out of legalistic, self-righteous attempts to demonstrate themselves worthy. Well, that's not love. And they didn't love. They didn't love God or others. Well, love motivates that desire for God to be glorified, that desire for us to to find our full satisfaction in him. As expressed towards others, it is that desire that other people look like Jesus. That's love. Because when others look like Jesus, then Jesus looks great, and the expression of our love towards others is that they would know that Jesus is great, that they would see his exaltation And so love provides the motivation and power. We want people to know Jesus because it is our one goal in life to make God look great. And he does not, cannot look great unless Jesus is exalted. So that's the goal of every Christian. We also said that love on on these two commands depends the whole law and the prophets, that love's actions are defined by the commandments in the law. You're not allowed to dredge up your own definition. Love is to obey. Love is to not commit adultery. Love is to not lie. Love is to not steal. Love is positively to be kind and compassionate and gracious, all with the proper motivation. That is, again, the people will be conformed to the image of Christ, that God would be glorified. And we said that love fulfills the intent of the law. So in Romans, Paul says, love does no wrong towards another. Thus, love is the fulfillment of the law. Holiness. You see, our holiness expressed is love. You can't say, I love you, and disobey the commands of Scripture because that would be harming someone. Every act towards someone else that doesn't conform to the truths of Scripture is ultimately harming them. It isn't loving them. We can't do things that Scripture says we shouldn't do and say, I love you, or refuse to do things that Scripture says we should do and say, oh, I love you. No, we don't. So love really boils down the entire law. And we finished last week by saying love is completed under the new covenant. That's always been true of of the law. That has to be obeyed in love. That for it to be its intent is a proper relationship with God and a relationship towards others. But we live in a time now when we can live that out more fully than anyone who's ever lived in these last 2,000 years. Why? Because we have the fulfilled canon of scripture. Every command of God is actually now given to us. Remember Paul says in Romans, the Old Testament, sure. So, So the law but then also, if there's any other command, every other thing we're given in Scripture, and under the new covenant, we have all of the expression of the law of Christ, and we have it laid out for us with nothing missing. We also have the Spirit of God permanently indwelling us. Although the Spirit dwelt with Israel, and the Spirit worked in the hearts of people, He did not permanently indwell them as He does now. And so we have the ability, far beyond even the Old Testament saints, to live out what love actually is. And the question is, how are we doing? Are we taking hold of the power that we have with the completed canon, the truth of the word of God, having seen in Scripture the completion of love in Christ, which was only looked forward to in the Old Testament. We look back and see the fullness of that expression in the New Testament. And we have the church of God to strengthen and hold us accountable in love. We don't have to go to a temple and gaze at the priests doing their work and only they can go in and only one priest can go into the Holy of Holies. No, we have the privilege of being the temple. And as we come together, we are able to to live out the love of God on full display so people can see and know him through the church and we can be strengthened and held accountable. So truly, love is the fulfillment 
of the law. On love depend the whole law and the prophets. So that's how Jesus answers their question. You're to love. And you are to love the Lord your God. And now he's going to leave them with a final question, which not only answers the issue of authority, but also condemns them for refusing to obey this first commandment, which is love the Lord your God, because he's about to say, oh, and I'm God. The Messiah is God, and you have not loved me. So he condemns them both on their refusal to bend the knee to his authority and on their refusal to love him, which is the primary command. So let's look at Jesus's final question, really. So he asks this final question in two sets of questions. So the first part of that final question. So here, Jesus' first question from verse 42. So he says, well, now, while the Pharisees were gathered together. Again, so they don't answer him at the end of verse 40. He gives an answer, and and again, they're done. But they have apparently gathered together again. Maybe they're going to try to come up with something else. They always do this. They regroup, they huddle. What's the game plan now? Right, they're looking, trying to figure out, now what do we ask? Now what are we going to do? So this now indicates that this is right after, the same time frame, right after Jesus has answered their question. They're huddled together. So Jesus gives them no opportunity to say anything else. He goes at them with a question. Right, so now, as they were gathered together, perhaps trying to figure out what else to do, they're like, oh, we failed. Jesus didn't misanswer the question. He still gives us no reason to publicly come against him and arrest him. That's what they're looking for, remember. They want to kill him. So they're trying to discredit him in the eyes of the crowd so they can make a public move and put him, imprison him and ultimately kill him. That's what they want. Well, he's not given them that opportunity. So they're stuck once again. And so now Jesus presses the issue with this first question that he asks. And here's the question. He says in verse 41, verse 42, what do you think about the Christ whose son and he? So the question is the Christ is whose son? Now, We could substitute for that word Christ there, the Messiah. Remember that Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is his title. He is Jesus, his human name, which means Savior. He is Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one predicted in the Old Testament. So when he asks this, he is saying, who's the Messiah? Whose son is the Messiah? And again, he's indirectly working his way through this issue. He is not saying, who do you think I am? He could just as easily say that. But he doesn't. He's again giving them, not giving them any opportunity to come against him. But indirectly, he is forcing them to see who he actually is. And also, he's he's forcing the crowd, or he's exposing who he truly is to the crowd. But he asks it in this form, really indirectly. So whose son is the Christ? Now, as I've mentioned, Jesus is doing this indirectly. But let's consider how Jesus has already acknowledged who he is as he's entered into the city. In Matthew 21, verse 9, the crowd's going ahead of him. And those who followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. So he's going to ask the question, whose son is the Messiah? Well, they've, the crowd's already been shouting that. This was the most obvious answer ever. And Jesus has already received honor as the son of David. So when he asks, who is the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they respond, and yes, we'll see in just a minute, with the son of David. Well, he's already received praise as the son of David. So again, while he's not directly stating it, it's pretty clear what he's actually saying. This is true also just a little further after he cleanses the temple. And in the temple, what were they saying? Matthew 21, 15. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done and the children who were shouting in the temple, do you remember what they were shouting? Hosanna to the son of David. And they became indignant. They say, why are you receiving this praise? And Jesus says, it's rightful praise. It's my praise. It's my house. And I deserve this praise. So while he is not saying here directly, I am the Messiah, he is asking whose son is the Messiah, he has already acted as the Messiah, receiving that praise that the people were giving him. So he's giving them no opportunity to publicly condemn him, but he is making it very clear who he really is. And Jesus uses this question to set up his next one. He's going to work in a progression here. So he asks the obvious question to then stump them, to really put them in a position where they're going to be unable to answer the next question without condemning themselves once again. The religious leaders and the people did not believe that the Messiah was to be holy God. Amazingly, even though the scriptures make that clear in the Old Testament, they didn't understand it. They seem to believe that the Messiah would be no more than a powerful, conquering human king from the line of David. They were essentially were treating the Messiah much like people treat the Messiah today. Maybe a great man, maybe a wonderful person, but not holy God, not the Lord God. 
Jesus will now demonstrate from Scripture that the Messiah is more than the son of David. He's not less than that. He's not, going to, he's not somehow saying, well, I'm not really the son of David, I'm something else. What he's going to say is, I am the son of David, but I am also something else, which is really bound up in what it means to be the descendant of David as described here. He's going to say that the son of David means that he is in fact equal with Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. Although the religious leaders don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus wants to be sure that everyone knows the true character of Messiah as God. Jesus has worked very carefully to be sure that everyone knows whom they are actually rejecting. When he goes to the cross, he will have publicly made it clear that he is the king, that he is the Lord. And then in this last question, that he is God. Now indirectly, again, he's already stated those things, but now he's going to bring a a direct scriptural argument that proves that the Messiah is God, and he's going to leave them with that. You are crucifying your king, you are crucifying the heir of David, you are crucifying the Messiah who is fully the Lord God. And so when they put him on the cross, they should have and had every opportunity to know who he truly was. This is, in fact, love for them. He is making sure that there was no question, that there was, there was no doubt ultimately, even though they did not believe this, he was making it clear so they could make a change, so they could properly respond to him, but they did not. So ultimately this condemns them in the fullest. So he asks this question, this first question, the Christ is whose son? And the Pharisees give their answer, again right away immediately, because this was an easy answer. And always the Pharisees just jump right in. They, you think, would think at some point they would, you know, they would think better of this. But every time he asks them a question, they want to demonstrate their own ability to answer from Scripture, that they know the answers, so they immediately respond. He is the son of David. Really, they just say, of David. They complete a sentence almost. Whose son is the Christ? Of David is what they say. And I'm, I'm sure they thought, again, why is he asking this? This is easy. The Messiah is the son of David. Now, of course, even in this, they're condemning themselves because Jesus has just received that praise. The whole crowd has said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David. But they answer easily, of course. The Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one, will be of the line of David. And we understand that when it says son here, it's not talking about the first generation. It's talking about a descendant of, and oftentimes son is used in that way. It can be multiple generations, a few generations. So really here he's saying the Messiah is to be the descendant of, in the line of, having the lineage that comes from David. And it is clear from the Old Testament that the Messiah would have to be in David's line. That's, that, that's where they were drawing that information from the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, 12. Remember that David wanted to build a house for God. And one of the great reversals, which is really what salvation is, isn't it? It's what God always does. He says, David, you can't build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. I mean, unprompted. David didn't even, he didn't ask for that. He said, I want to build you a house. God says, no, no, I'm building yours. What an amazing thing. 2 Samuel 7, 12, and we call it the Davidic covenant where God makes a covenant with David, a unilateral covenant based on what he will do. He says, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him. He will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men, the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house, verse 16 of 2 Samuel, and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. And certainly we have the picture of Solomon who comes, that first descendant, and who does in fact build a house. But Clearly there is more going on because he says, your house and your kingdom shall endure forever. There's an everlasting kingdom coming out. Solomon was not the end. This prophecy, this Davidic covenant, includes and must include the forever king and the one who will reign forever on this throne of David. And that was understood. Now, the religious leaders understand this. And you might remember, now I know it was years ago in our study, but you've probably read Matthew since then. Remember what Matthew opened with? His whole point in the book of Matthew is that Jesus was who? The son of David. The one who comes in the proper lineage as the king. That's why I open up every theme with what? Jesus is the king. Because that's how Matthew opened the book. Remember Matthew 1.1? The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. The son of David, the son of Abraham, and he moves down in that lineage. So this is what this is what Matthew's proving. The, the Pharisees understood this from a human physical standpoint that the Messiah must be 
in the line of David. But what Jesus is about to expose is that they didn't understand what son of David meant. They didn't understand the Davidic covenant. They didn't understand the rest of the predictions about the Messiah in the Old Testament, that he was more than a human descendant. He was God. Because even in their desire for the Messiah to come, it is very clear that it was their goal to retain power. Somehow, it seems like they thought they, that whenever this Messiah came, he would pretty much do what they wanted, that they could direct him in some way. He's a human ruler, he'll come, and we'll kind of set the, the, the tone, set the scene as a human ruler, then you know, we, we, will, we will follow after him, but really, it'll be with our agenda. Now, Jesus is about to expose that this would be impossible. He's not a human ruler. He is much more. So Jesus' follow-up question. So back in our text, and he asked the first question, who, the Christ, whose son is he? They say, easy answer, the son of David. Even condemning themselves in that because Jesus has already received praise as the son of David, the true Messiah. He said to them, verse 43, here's the trap. Here's, here's what he springs on them. Then how does David, so this, he is, he's supposed to be the son of David. Goes, well, how, does, how then does David himself say, the Lord called, or then how does David in the spirit, verse 43, call him Lord? So the whole point is this. So if the Messiah is the son of David, that is coming after him, one who is simply a human being in the line of David, how is it that really the greater, the King David, from whom the son comes, how can this great one call his son greater than he? Now we're going to flesh that out in the quote in Psalm 110. But that's the, whole, that's the whole idea. And the Jews would have understood this. No father called his son Lord ever. Right? Even, if the, even if his son after him was a king, he was the first. He's the father. He's always in charge. So that's the point Jesus is making. If he's really the son, the descendant of David, how can David himself, the starter of this lineage, the one who was given the Davidic covenant, how can he say to this Messiah, you're greater than me? That's what he's really saying. And we're going to prove that from Psalm. Jesus proves that from the quote that he makes. So he says, how can David say he's his son? And then the question might be, well, where does David say that? Where does David say that his son is the Lord? Oh, Psalm 110. So let's go ahead and turn there. Well, actually, before we do that, we've got one more thing to do. In the text again, he says, how does he say in the Spirit? So then how does David in the Spirit call him Lord? So this is, in our outline, Jesus' follow-up question. The question is, how does David call him, that is the Messiah, Lord? And yet, Jesus points to David's state. That is, how was David making this statement? He says, in the Spirit. He says, how does David, in the Spirit, call him Lord? Well, what does that mean? It's not David's human spirit. Sometimes spirit is used that way. But we know from Mark, the, our parallel passage, when Jesus said this, he said, Holy Spirit. Matthew doesn't record him, that, the word holy here, but that's the idea. How does David in the Holy Spirit say this? What is Jesus doing? He's grounding his, the authority of David in making that statement with the authority of God. That is, the Spirit of God is speaking through David. So this is an authoritative statement from God that he's about to point to. Now that is true of all of Scripture. Is it not? That is, Scripture is the work of the Spirit of God through men. And so Jesus is making that clear. This is not just David as some human being, as the king of Israel, saying something off the cuff or something that he thought he wanted to say. This is David in the Spirit of God. That is, being prompted by the Spirit of God in revelatory fashion to reveal the truth because God can never reveal anything that isn't true. And so by grounding the authority here, he is forestalling all argument. Well, David just said that. You know, David's just a man. Well, isn't that what people, the argument that people are making against Scripture continually? They're saying, look, people wrote this. Why should I live my life after what a bunch of men wrote these 66 books? And their question is a good one. Why should they? If I come to you morning after morning and you go to your Bible studies and they say, well, this is a human book that's got some great stuff in it. It's really powerful. The men were, had inspiration and they, and, and they said great things. Well, why are you listening to this? Why not just go pick up the works of Plato or Aristotle or some, you know, some, some philosopher from our day? Why is what we're doing here any more important than that? Well, only because this comes from the Spirit of God. Only because the authority and sufficiency of what we believe is found in God, is grounded in God himself. That's what the scriptures are. And so I'm taking a moment to dwell on this because Jesus does. He wants them, he reminds them, they believe that was true. But he's reminding them, if you're going to deny what I'm about to say, you, he's getting ahead of them, you're going to be denying what God said. 
what the Spirit of God says. So be careful. Watch out. And I'd say the same to you. If you're going to, decide, if you're going to deny anything that Scripture says, what you are doing is denying what God says. So watch out. You're not denying what I say. You can sit here all day long and say, Chris, I don't agree with your opinions. You know, and any Bible teacher that you have, well, that's fine. You, you don't have to agree with my opinions. But you have to agree with Scripture because this is the Word of God. So Jesus himself brings that to bear. How does David say, in the Spirit? And this is used in multiple places, both in Old and New Testament, when the writers were talking about how they were able to write authoritatively from God. Second Samuel 23, 2. The Spirit of God spoke to me, and his word was on my tongue, as a prophet gives his proclamation. In Acts 1.16, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David. It's the Spirit of God that tells these things. Hebrews 3.7, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice in that quote, it doesn't even give the human author. It says the Spirit said that through that human author. That's the implication. And then to, to put all this together, a verse that you ought to be able to go to at the drop of a hat, you ought to know this verse. And anytime anyone asks you about the nature of Scripture, you ought to go here and you ought to remember it. 2 Peter 1.21. It says, For no prophecy of Scripture. Remember that prophecy is not just foretelling, that is events that happen in the future. Prophecy is foretelling, that is the principles and commands of God. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But, by, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Not a single word of the Scriptures is human generated. It's through humans, right? Through their mind and out through their pens and, and yet it is all from the Spirit of God. And people might say, well, I don't believe that. Well, I mean, they can say that, but the scriptures clearly lay out that that is what they are. And you want to tell that to people. They say, well, it's just a book of men. Well, the scriptures themselves claim that that's not true. Well, I don't believe the scriptures. Well, I mean, you have to deal with that another way. Uh, in their minds, hey, you can deny it all day long. It doesn't mean it isn't true. But you can't say the scriptures don't say this. It is not a human book, and no prophecy was ever made by a single act of human will. David never, as he wrote in the Psalms, was simply doing something that David wanted to do. Paul was never having a, you know, I think I want to talk about this today. Here's my TED talk for the day. No, it was always, anything that's written in Scripture was not made by an act of human will. Now, I, I think you guys understand that. I think that's why you're here. Why would you come and sit week after week to listen to me give you my opinions? You wouldn't, and you don't. But I just want you to remember the gravity of that. These are God's words. And Jesus himself, appeal, as God himself, he appeals to the spirit-inspired nature of Scripture. Jesus says these are God's words, and he appeals to that as he goes back to the Old Testament to reveal what David said. So please don't appeal to your own words, but please don't be cowed by others who say, well, it's just a human book, and that's just your opinion. It isn't. This is what God says. This is what the Spirit of God says. Says. So now to David's statement. So David's state is in the Spirit. He is making this revelation under the power of inspiration of the Spirit of God. And that's all of Scripture, everything we have written down. And then his statement, what did he actually say? Turn to Psalm 110. Let's look at this. Okay. I'll, I'll read it from this text where it says, the quote is, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. That's the quote that Jesus gives. And he quotes from Psalm 110. So now turn there. What does this look like in the Old Testament? He's quoting in, it's written for us, the text in Greek. And we're going to need some help to understand what it means because he's quoting from Hebrew. He's quoting from Psalm 110, particularly when it comes to the name of God. So Psalm, in Psalm 110, the, the text of Psalm 110 says this, A Psalm of David, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, did you notice something there? I quoted for you as the text, the title, a Psalm of David. That's in the text. Now, you might have a bolded, uh, italicized title given that's put in by the New American Standard of the ESV. Mine says, the Lord gives dominion to the king. That's a human insertion. But when it says there, notice that a psalm of David is put in the same bold, the same kind of font as the text itself. That comes along with the text. When you're reading in, psalm, in, in other psalms where it says, to the choir director, and in this meter, because that comes, that's part of the inspired text. You might not have understood that. That's not inserted. Someone didn't insert a psalm of David. If it's bold and black in your Bible, uh, written in, in that, in bold type, that's something that's added. This isn't. The Psalm of David goes, a Psalm of David goes along with it. And the authorship of this particular Psalm is very important. And we're going to do our 
We're going to do hermeneutics this morning. We're going to do the science of interpretation because that's what Jesus is doing. He's going to use the authorship. He's going to use the two statements made by David about this Lord, Adonai, as we will see, to prove that he is God. So we're going to have to work our way through it carefully as Jesus was quoting it. So first, the first statement made here is the Lord said to my Lord. Now, in Greek, the two words, when it's quoted and, and written down in the text in Greek, it just says kurios and kurios. It was, it was the only Greek word for Lord, essentially. But in Hebrew, when it says the Lord says to my Lord, if you have the New American Standard, which I love for, for this reason, you will see it says the Lord, first one is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. What does that mean in the New American Standard? It means that that's translating the word Yahweh, the covenant name of God, the name of God that no one would say, essentially. And so it is, it is, that's the, the great I am, the name that God uses for himself when he is speaking to Israel and says, this is who I actually am, the eternally pre-existent God who covenants with his people and lives out that covenant. It is the very character of God. The Lord says, and then the next one is capital L and little O-R-D. When the New American Standard in the Old Testament says, puts the Lord that way, that's Adonai, another name of God, the God, God referred to as the authoritative, powerful God. And in nearly, every, in most cases, Adonai is used to refer, refer to the Lord God. Now, there are some cases where Lord, as Adonai, capital L and the little O-R-D, does talk about a powerful ruler that isn't God. There are some few cases where that does it. Yahweh, that's never true. So, some would say, well, really what's going on here is when it says, the Lord says to my Lord, it's not David actually writing that. And the, and the later commentators have come along, the liberal commentators, and said, no, this isn't saying... So it doesn't ultimately say that David is saying that a descendant of his is greater than he is. This is some other person in David's court or coming later talking about the greatness of David. So they're saying, well, th what this really means is Yahweh said to this other great king, hey, um, you're, you're, you have my favor. You have my blessing. And yet what Jesus is making very clear when he says David says this is that David is saying this about someone else. And David was the greatest king. He was the one who was the, the highest and, and the, the anointed king of Israel. So whoever he says this about, if he says someone is his Lord, it means that person is not a human being, is not a human king. So the Lord said to my Lord. Notice here also the personal pronoun. This was the Lord that David served. This was the Lord that David subjected himself and came underneath. Well, that's fascinating because what? Yahweh is the one that we come underneath. Yahweh is the one that we, that we bend the knee to. David understood that. So he's already making an equation here. Yahweh said to my Adonai, the Lord that I bend the knee to, my Lord, my God. So this personal relationship is revealed. Tran Osborne, who wrote an excellent commentary on Matthew, says this, Modern scholars are skeptical as to an originally messianic intention in this psalm, since it's seen as a typical royal psalm in which a courtier speaks in exaggerated terms about the dignity of the current king, probably David, not a future Messiah. But if David himself is the speaker, he's presumably not speaking about himself as my Lord. David's not calling himself my Lord. So the messianic understanding of the psalm depends upon its authorship. For those who, like Jesus and his audience, accepted it as a psalm of David, Jesus' argument holds in this first line. David was the king. David is the one writing this. He was the author. And so he's talking about someone greater than him. He's, that person is being called. David is referring to that person as Adonai, who is then affirmed by Yahweh. Now the second statement that he makes. Sit at my right hand. So in Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Here, to sit at the right hand is what? To have the hand of honor and favor. But also you will notice, and it's, it's strengthened when he says, I'm going to make all your enemies a footstool for your feet, that this at my right hand is on the throne. It is ruling. It is saying that this Lord, so as Yahweh says to my Lord, he is really giving him equal authority, which no one gets equal authority with God. MacArthur puts it this way. Jesus is here declaring the Messiah, Messiah's deity. Why? Because under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, David had declared that God told the Messiah to sit at God's right hand, a place recognized by the Jews to be a designation of co-equal rank and authority. The verb behind sit in, this, in the original text indicates a continuous sitting in the place of exaltation. 
God was going to bring the Messiah, the Christ, to a place of equality with himself in honor, power, and glory. And we understand it to be back to that place. John 17 reveals what? Jesus says, Father, restore to me the glory which I had with you before the world was. So always the Son had this authority. He then veils himself, as we sang this morning, in flesh and, and condescends to come down to the earth so that he might, in taking on this flesh, he humbles himself. But God will again exalt the Messiah to this place that he's always had of co-equal, co-heir, co-ruler with Yahweh himself. When he says, at my right hand, that again is an attestment to the greatness of this Lord Adonai that he is equal with Yahweh. And this is only strengthened further by the last sentence. So sit at my right hand and tell I make your enemies, what? A footstool for your feet. Now, you'll, you'll notice or you'll remember that in the quote in Matthew, the way it's quoted from the Septuagint Virgin, the LXX, it's until I put your enemies under your feet. But in, that's, that's just bringing from the Old Testament this metaphor, which is much more graphic. Until I make your enemies a what? A footstool for your feet. What that means is this, that in ancient times when a king would conquer his enemies, he would then essentially lay them on the ground or bring them before his throne, and he would set his foot on their neck. You'll see this in the Old Testament. David did this to his own enemies. And, and this is several other places in Scripture. When one is defeated, to show your power over them, you would place your feet on their neck, literally like they were a footstool for you. That was how great your dominion over them was. It's a very graphic symbol of conquering and that the person who is becoming the footstool has been totally dominated and subjugated to the one who is doing the conquering. And notice, it says, all the enemies of Adonai, of this Lord, would be placed underneath his feet. Who would do that? Yahweh would. There will be no enemy that will be left undone. Well, the enemies of Adonai, the enemies of the Messiah are who? Those are also the enemies of God. Satan, the angelic powers who have revolted against him. And so to say that I'm going to take all your enemies and put them under your feet, is again an indication of his co-equal nature with Yahweh himself. That was every enemy. And all enemies, all powers, if every other power is subjugated, it means that the Adonai's power, this Lord's power, is the greatest. And that's co-equal with Yahweh, whose power is also the greatest, as it were. So at his right hand, says MacArthur again, the Messiah would be invincible because God would put his enemies beneath his feet, a figure of abject, helpless subjugation. When a defeated enemy was brought before an ancient oriental monarch, the ruler would make that enemy prostrate himself at his feet. The king would then place his foot on the neck of the vanquished enemy as, it were, as if it were a footstool. All detractors, deniers, and other enemies of the Messiah are doomed to subjugation beneath his control. And thus, the enemies of God are the same as the enemies of Yahweh, and he is of equal power, equal authority, as all enemies are subjected to him. And before we move on from this point, Salvation can be viewed from a lot of different angles. This is not one we look at salvation, a way that we look at salvation often. That is the utter, total triumph of God over his enemies. But I want you to think about the ramifications of this. And this is very graphic. The Messiah will have all enemies subjected to him. He will trample over them. Think about it. Now, the very Pharisees and religious leaders who are standing before him are those enemies. All the ones who refuse to bend the knee to Jesus, there's no neutrality. All of those are enemies of God, enemies of Christ. Anyone who does not bend the knee to him, recognizing him as Savior and Lord, responding to him in repentance and faith, those are enemies of God. What is their fate? They are dominated by God. They are trampled under by God. The power of God will, will send them ultimately to eternal hell. And so... Who are you going to serve? Who would you rather come underneath? Would you rather come underneath Jesus, bend the knee to him as the Messiah, or one to be trampled upon by him as an enemy of God? This is serious business. We're talking about little babies in mangers. We're talking about the, the holy God who came and lived a perfect life and died for you and yet was buried, was raised again on the third day and who proclaimed his triumph. In First Peter, we were talking about this with the youth on Wednesday night. When Jesus is in the grave, his human body is there, he goes and he makes a triumphant proclamation to the demons who have been kept in darkness and prison. Those very demons that, that tried to destroy the entire human race in the, in the days of Noah and almost succeeded. Only eight people were left of all of the people on the earth. And Jesus goes to them during the time of his 
burial, when his body's in the grave, in the spirit, alive, and he goes and makes proclamation. He says, I win, you lose. That attempt that you made to try to destroy the the entire human race, now I, the Messiah, have come. That seed that you were trying to destroy to not allow to be born so that God's work could not happen through the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head, I'm that seed, I'm alive, and you lost, and you will be punished forever as a result of that. That's serious stuff. God is not afraid to proclaim his victory. He rejoices and exults in his victory over those who deny the Son. And so let's be sure that we're on the right side. It's not God's on your side. You had best be on his. Because if you're not, he will trample you under his feet and will rejoice in that because you did not respond to his Son. You see what Jesus is saying. You see how important this becomes. Salvation can be viewed from the terms of victory. Yes, it's eternal life. Yes, it's relationship. Yes, it's with God forever. But what's the alternative? That you would be eternally dominated, subjugated, and eternally destroyed. So the stakes are high. And Jesus is making that very clear in this quote. I'm the Messiah. David said that. If I'm a, if, if, how does David say to his son, he's his Lord? Well, what it means is he's both son and Lord. That is, he is both human and God. Because that's the last part. So Jesus returns back to that. So back in Matthew 22... Says, how does David in the spirit call him Lord? So the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies, until I put your enemies beneath your feet. Verse 45, here's how he ends. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Boom. And it's absolutely silent. Because they have no answer to this. What are they going to say? Well, well, I guess that means that the Messiah is God. Well, that ruins all their plans. That, that's, not, that's, not gonna, that's not what they were expecting. That's not what they wanted. And they certainly would never give a hint of that and that Jesus might be God. So they're, they're struck utterly speechless. They have nothing to say. They can't. But Jesus leaves ringing in the air what? I'm that Messiah. I am God. I'm not just David's son. You can't just dismiss me by saying I am even the rightful human ruler of Israel. I am the eternal God-given ruler of the universe as well as the ruler of Israel. My authority is total. Bend the knee. Believe in me. They don't. That's certainly an inadequate response, isn't it? They've just been declared that the Messiah is God as well as the rightful human ruler, and they just go silent? That's not going to cut it, by the way. You're not going to be able to say, well, you know, like our agnostics of the day or even some of our atheists, well, I just haven't made a decision. I'm just not saying anything. I'm not going to decide about who Jesus is. That's making a decision. Silence is your doom. You have to affirm that Jesus is Lord. You have to confess with your mouth that he is the Lord or you will be destroyed by him. The love that he offered to you, rejected, will be your death. So it's an entirely inadequate response. So two things that Jesus is saying, I think if we want to sum it up, he doesn't flesh out the answer to the question, but it is clear. From the psalm, Messiah is God. And so that means two things. First, that the Messiah, so this is on your outline, underneath you know, this final part of it, David calls him Lord, how is he his son? He leaves it in question form, but this is essentially the statement. The Messiah is the rightful human king of Israel. He is the son of David. He's not denying that. He's just combining the two. He's the human, fully human, rightful heir of the throne of Israel as well as the holy God, Adonai, equal with Yahweh, to whom all enemies will be subjected. He is saying both. Jesus is claiming that the Messiah is in fact David's son, a human being, and thus the rightful and promised king of Israel from David's line. But he's also saying the Messiah is the conquering holy God of the universe. So he's saying that the Messiah is the exalted Lord, ruling at the right hand of God the Father with equal power and subjecting all the nations and powers to himself. And here are the implications for the Pharisees. And for all those who refuse to bend the knee to Jesus, this is the Lord that is to be loved. Remember, he just said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And now he's saying, I am the Lord your God. The Messiah is the Lord. And you are not obeying this first commandment towards me. So the Lord is to be loved. And the Pharisees hated him. The Pharisees hated him. The Lord, this is the Lord that is to be honored. And the Pharisees despised him. They were here trying to trick him and kill him. This is the Messiah, the one whom David said is my Lord. And they honored David. They thought David was the greatest, the mightiest king, almost as revered as Moses or Abraham was David on equal plane with them. 
And David is the one saying, the Messiah is greater than me. And they are refusing to respond to the one who stands before them and says, I'm that son. Which means, I'm that God. So the Lord that is to be honored, the Pharisees despised. The Lord that is to be submitted to, the Pharisees exalted themselves over him. We'll determine your fate. We'll tell you what to do. We'll try to put you under our control. The Lord for whom lives are given, the Lord of life, the Lord who gives life, the Pharisees were trying to take his life rather than recognizing their need for the life that he would provide. This is the Lord who is equal with God and the Pharisees called him Satan. They, called him, they, they relegated him to an evil power and Jesus is saying, how can that possibly be? The Messiah was just stated in Psalm 110 by David himself to be equal with Yahweh. He's Satan? Are you kidding me? I am the Lord. I am Messiah. I am the one to whom you should bend your knee. Now, you need to know that in just a few days, in two more days, three days, in the Passion Week, Jesus will state this directly, Matthew 26, 63. But Jesus kept silent as they continued to ask him questions. The high priest finally says to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Are you God's Son? Are you really God? And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Yes. And you will hereafter see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. But Jesus has made this clear publicly. I'm the Messiah. I receive praise as the son of David, but the son of David is greater than a human king. He is greater than David himself. He is God. Publicly, he made it clear. Privately, he will make it even more directly clear when he's already on trial. It's already been done, and it's clear to you and I. He is the king, the Lord, the fully human, fully God, Lord and master of the universe who has the right then and power to accomplish our salvation and deserves our full worship. That's the Messiah. And the Pharisees were doing none of that. They were rejecting this very one that they should have known. And it is fascinating. He doesn't even point to Isaiah. He could have done that. There's multiple places Jesus could have gone. So you missed it totally. I'm the Lord. But he goes to David, the one who, of who he was descended. And he does that purposely. I'm greater than the one from whom I'm descended. It's, it's a very powerful, very careful contrast that he makes. And the last part there is the Pharisee silence. No one was able to answer him a word. Not because they might have, uh, they probably had some kind of explanation for that. I mean, they, they talked about these passages of Scripture all the time. There's some evidence that the nature of this psalm as messianic, messianic was understood by many of the Jews or stated even by some of the rabbis. They believed it was messianic. They just didn't believe it was Jesus. But nonetheless, they probably had an answer, but they couldn't because they would have looked foolish. And so they say nothing in return. And then it says, no one asked him any more questions. <laughs> they don't dare. He's finished this out. I am God. Adonai. I am greater than David. I mean, if, if you're still struggling with the Lord said to my Lord, why is that such a big deal? I mean, if you go home this afternoon, if you have children, you don't sit down at the table and you as the father say, my Lord, to your son, what would you like? Your son, if your son were to sit down at the table and you're sitting at the head of the table and he would come and elbow you over and say, Dad, I need to sit here. And he were to sit at the head of the table and then begin to dispense to the family all of the rules and the things you were going to do that week. How would you respond to that? You are not the Lord. You are not greater than me. I'm dead. That, because that's the thing that's ringing in their minds. There's no way that a descendant can be greater than the dad, than the father. But Jesus claimed it. He's greater than David the better David, the greater David, the the eternal David. And so they're done. They they don't even want to ask him any more questions. They're totally finished. They they have no public opportunity to arrest Jesus. They don't dare do that. He silenced them completely. He will provide, he has provided them with no excuse to do so. The only thing they have left to do is take things into their own hands secretly, which they will do. They can't do it publicly. He's totally refuted and thwarted them in every way. In fact, in Mark it says after he did this, the people were delighted in him. He won the round, hands down. He then, in Matthew 23, as we'll see, takes takes advantage and spends spends most of the chapter just absolutely hammering home their disobedience and their condemnation. So he takes full advantage of this, but he he, he wins here, publicly. So they're going to have to secretly take him and, and kill him, which is what they will do. But he, we leave him here with the final question, and really that's the question I would have. 
How does David then call him Lord? How are you treating him? How can he be a human being? He's actually God. So here are the questions that flow from that this morning. One, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? The fully human descendant of David who is Israel's rightful king. He is that. Do you believe it? Do you recognize that he fulfilled all of the necessary obligations of the of a true Messiah and he was in David's line and everything that was predicted was fulfilled and that he is rightfully the ruler of his ethnic people Israel but secondly do you believe that he's the Messiah the true Lord God who has subjugated all his enemies who is the rightful ruler of the universe are 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 you responding to him in that way not just stating that that's the case but living your life loving him he's worthy of that love obeying him that's your way of loving him so Number question three is, not just do you believe that with your head, but have you bent the knee to Jesus in humble worship of him as your rightful Lord and ruler? It's not enough to know this with your head. You can't just say, I believe that. I've believed that since I was a little child. Uh, uh, you know, tell us something else. I can't. Ha- are you living that? Have you repented and believed? Have you bent the knee? Treating him, living for him, and humbly worshiping him as your rightful Lord and ruler. Have you repented and believed in Jesus? in a humble acknowledgement of your need of the atoning sacrifice for sin. Not that just he's the rightful Lord and ruler, but that he's your only savior. And that his ability to rule and reign and who he is as God and man is what provides the ability for him to save you. He can't be your savior if he's not those things. But he's not only master and ruler, he is also savior. Have you acknowledged your need of his atoning sacrifice? And have you abandoned all your own attempts, bending the knee to him? And then lastly, do you love Jesus as the Lord your God? It all goes back to that. That's the one response. It's a response of love. Are you seeking to glorify him, to find your full satisfaction in him by humbly obeying every command and principle of Scripture without regard to the sacrifice required or what you will receive in return? Our definition of love, biblical definition of love to God. So knowing these things, is your life then poured out and sacrificed back to your Savior, loving Him by glorifying Him and finding full satisfaction in Him? And will you express that this Christmas time? Will will, will all of your motivation and all of your desire be centered around Jesus, even as you enjoy all the wonderful things of this season, but only made wonderful because of Jesus? And actually proclaiming the doom of men apart from Jesus. Father, we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for the truths of Scripture. We thank you for the precious privilege of being able to read these truths and and that you've given us grace to understand them, to be able to apply them. And I pray for each one here this morning, Lord, if there is one here who has not yet bent the knee to you, has not properly understood you as, as fully human, the rightful king, the rightful human king, and also as fully God, the, the, the rightful God of the universe that they would both recognize that and respond to that in humble repentance and faith. And Father, for each of us who, who knows you, who loves you, who has recognized this only by your power, only by your spirit did we know this, I pray that you would humble us and help us to long to proclaim this truth and joyful humility to a world that desperately needs to hear it. And that as a church, we would live out love to you and love to others on the basis of your authority, power, and personhood as fully God and fully man. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen.